Today we all lead incredibly hectic lives. If you're anything like me, getting enough sleep is a big problem. So in this programme, I'm going to look at 10 different ways in which science can help us get a decent night's sleep. We help journalist Dominic Diamond conquer his horrendous insomnia. <clears throat> I hate this. Not a thing I can do about it. Joe Swift of Gardener's World road tests a traditional sleep remedy. That is nice. Cheers. We help this man stop snoring. Stand-up comic Russell Kane battles the stress that keeps him awake at night. And let it go, nice and relaxed. And chef Aldo Zilli helps uncover the culinary secret to a good night's sleep. Come on. Good morning. Coming up on the programme today, the Space Shuttle Discovery has taken off from the Kennedy I'm Kate Space Center after a series of delays. And I co-present the breakfast programme for BBC News. Working on BBC Breakfast means a three o'clock start, 3 a.m. that is. So sleep and getting enough of it has become something of an obsession. I'm sure you have your own rituals in terms of what you do to help you get to sleep. A nice warm bath or a hot water bottle are obvious favourites. But as our first experiment shows, while temperature is connected to helping us sleep, is not quite in the way you might expect. I know I'm a little underdressed today for a newsreader, but I'm going to take part in an experiment to show you a great way to trick your body into falling asleep. Dr Barbara Stone is a leading sleep expert. She's going to monitor my internal body temperature over the next few hours. Barbara, hello. Hello, Kate. Now, what have you got for me? Well, I've got here a pill that uh, actually measures your temperature. OK. It's quite harmless. Yeah. It's a small electronic device. You swallow it and then we can plot your core temperature or deep body temperature using this device. So I'll just point this at you and I can pick up your temperature. OK. It'll take two hours for the thermometer pill to reach my intestines, where we'll get an accurate reading of my internal temperature. It's this internal body temperature that's key to falling asleep. My core temperature before getting into the bath is 37.4 degrees, which is pretty normal. So what we'll expect to see then as I take a bath is for my core body temperature to rise, obviously, because I'll be sitting in warm water. And it'll rise by about a degree, perhaps even more. But it's not that rise, that feeling of being warm and cosy, that then induces sleep, as you might think. As I relax in the bath, sure enough, my core body temperature starts to rise. You were a 37.4 before you got in, and now you're 38.5. But research shows the most important factor isn't the heat that makes you drowsy, but what happens to your core body temperature afterwards. I think that's quite hot enough. I think you can get out now. Out of the bath, my body cools down. And it's this reduction in temperature that helps me to sleep. It's only been recently that the drop in body temperature just before you go to sleep has been recognised as a trigger for sleep. So what have we got? Well, we've got your body temperature here just before you get in the bath and you can see it goes right up and then when you get out of the bath it falls right down again to almost as low as when you went in. And then it'll carry on falling during sleep and I'm sure you're feeling really sleepy now. I am, I feel like it. So, one easy way to ease yourself to sleep is to reduce your body temperature. Have a warm bath at least an hour before bedtime and then your body will cool down and that's what will help you to sleep.
When I go to bed, I'm usually out like a light, but there are times when I join the millions of insomniacs who face the horror of an endless sleepless night. So we thought we'd take an extreme case of insomnia to see if we can help. Writer and journalist Dominic Diamond is by night haunted by his inability to sleep. I am an insomniac, which means the way I look at it, I'm not a dad and I'm not a partner. He says his nights are hell, a mad world of lonely hours staring into darkness, only broken by restless snatches of sleep. I hate this. So I just... <clears throat> Dominic's insomnia affects the whole family. Kids! Get your suppers ready. Molly, come on, darling, get your supper. <laughs> if he slept, he'll be Mr. Fun. If he hasn't slept, you tread carefully around him because it's easier. The less I sleep, the more I withdraw from the family. I'm snappy, I'm irritable. It's just that I can't take part in any of this. The worst I remember, he didn't sleep for three days. It was horrible, really awful. I can remember just thinking he's going to die. Dominic's tried everything, from sleeping tablets to obsessive bedtime rituals. They've all failed. All right, now. Professor Colin Espy has been analysing Dominic's sleep patterns and thinks he might have a solution. There's a programme that we can use which would help you, and it's called sleep restriction. Mm -hmm. But what it would mean would be reducing greatly the amount of time you spend in bed. Mm -hmm. It might sound the wrong way round, but Professor Espy wants Dominic to spend less time in his bedroom than usual. From now on, Dominic's going to be restricted to six hours in his room, whether he sleeps or not. I worry that I'll spend a lot of that time just getting in the right state about not sleeping. That's my, that's my kind of worst case scenario. He's going to find this difficult. People with insomnia will typically spend longer in bed to try and catch up. Uh, what we do with sleep restriction is we actually systematically reduce the amount of time that people spend in bed. Now that's a difficult thing to do. My worry is, when my insomnia has been at its very worst, I genuinely was awake for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear about having any kind of sleep restriction is, am I going to go mad? It's the first night of a four-week programme. From now on, Dominic's only allowed in the bedroom for six hours. He must go to bed at two o'clock in the morning and rise at eight. At all other times, the bedroom is strictly out of bounds. He's been ordered to stay awake when he's not in the bedroom. Only then, according to Professor Espy, will Dominic stand a chance of conquering his insomnia. It's like his master and he's chained to it. So it'd be nice to break those chains. Dominic well knows six hours in bed for him doesn't mean six hours sleep, but at eight o'clock in the morning, even if he's asleep, he has to get up. In the morning, I'm so tired. I would do anything, anything for another half an hour or an hour's sleep. Just do anything, I'd pay a fortune. The aim of this sleep regime is to make Dominic so tired his disrupted sleep patterns are then broken. Things have been going okay. I'm averaging about four hours, 50 minutes sleep a night. I'm pretty tired, but I haven't gone mad. As the programme begins to work, Dominic starts to sleep in continuous blocks. I, I slept all right last night. Bye. See you in a minute. Bye, darling. Bye, darling. 
Dominic starting to feel the positive effect of unbroken sleep. Oh, sorry, Molly. I'm supposed to be grumpy in the morning. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Don't seem very grumpy today, do I? I have slept all night through for six hours without waking up. And that's just astonishing. After four weeks, Dominic reports back to Professor Espy. OK, Dominic, tell me a bit about how things have been going over the last few weeks. My entire association with sleep has been completely reinvented and completely changed. It's, it's not something that I feel fear or anxiety over. It's something that I actually embrace. It's something that I look forward to. And I love that feeling. Mm. I've never had it before and it's brilliant. Shush! All right, shush! There we go. He's been really, really good. He's been so much happier, so much more relaxed. And it's been great. It's really been good. I am the first person up in the morning now. I wake everyone else up, which never used to happen. And as of tonight, Phoebe and I will be back in the same bedroom, which we haven't been for years. Are you really? Yeah. Help! <laughs> if you're struggling with insomnia, a sleep restriction programme is definitely an option to consider. The key is to stay in the bedroom only to sleep and always get up at the same time each day. continent, the siesta is an accepted part of the daily routine, but we Brits have been somewhat sniffy about daytime napping. However, it can be a great way of boosting the energy levels. It's all a question of when you do it and for how long. Dee Kafari is one of Britain's leading yachtswomen and sails single-handedly around the world. For most of us, lack of sleep just makes us tired and edgy, but for Dee, it can be a matter of life or death. I am so tired, it's unbelievable. And over the last three days, I've probably slept about two and a half hours. The wind was just changing so much today, I didn't feel like I was going home. I felt like I was just battling, getting nowhere. Solo sailors can't afford to have one long sleep, so Dee has had to learn to snatch it when she can. Sleep has a major impact on me emotionally. When you're tired, everything seems exaggerated. The good bits seem excessively good and the bad bits seem excessively bad. Sailing at the level I'm sailing at, I can't afford for these huge highs and lows, otherwise your performance on the boat follows a similar curve to your highs and lows and that's, that can't be good. Dee's about to embark on her biggest challenge yet, the Vendée Globe round the world race. She's working with sports scientist John O'Hara from Leeds Metropolitan University. Can he help Dee cope with lack of sleep during the race and offer some useful tips and advice to all of us who suffer from not getting enough sleep? Looking at Dee's data, we could see that she's probably sleeping around three hours a, a day. Well, three hours sleep a day is clearly extreme. John recommends that Dee increases her sleep to at least five hours a day. Lots of napping um, throughout the day. I think probably at the moment you're maybe napping around eight times a day. If we can try and increase that to ten times a day, that would be good. Yep. You need to pace yourself over the whole duration of the event because if you don't bag enough, bag enough sleep, then essentially at some point you'll probably, probably break. And I'm more likely to break emotionally from this. Looking at this data and, and knowing you, yeah, you're more likely to sort of break down with your, your emotions rather than your physical abilities. Okay, five hours, no worries. If naps are to be of real value, they must be taken at the right time. So what is the best time to nap for Dee and for us? 
For most of us, napping is best between 2 and 5 in the afternoon, and ideally for around 30 minutes. Your body will fight any attempt to nap between 7 in the morning and 12 noon, and between 6 and 8 in the evening, so do avoid those times. If I can bear in mind everything I've learned, then hopefully I'll get a decent amount of sleep and be able to concentrate on the job at hand and put in a good performance. So I just got to kind of put it all together now. In November 2008, Dee started out on the Vendée Globe, armed with her new sleep plan. The race was particularly dramatic, with more than half the competitors dropping out, but Dee did her best to follow her napping regime. Wow, what a difference a couple of hours makes. This afternoon, I managed to get two really good one-hour sleeps in. I feel so much better and uh, a lot happier with things. So um, I highly recommend doing that. I should have done it a lot earlier. A triumphant D returned in February 2009, becoming the first woman to sail single-handedly, non-stop, both ways round the globe. I can't wait to get home, sleep in my own bed and sleep all the way through the night. It's going to be great. Napping worked for Dee and it can work for us too. If you are short of sleep, the best time for most of us to nap is between 2 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Sir, are you a snorer? Madam, are you a snorer? 15 million of us snore. Do you snore, sir? Yes, he does. Do ah, does he? <laughs> Can you give us a demonstration of how badly he snores? <laughs> does he sound like that? Even if you don't snore, the chances are you've been kept awake by someone else who does. Do you snore in bed, darling? That's my grandson. What sort of noises does she make? <laughs> A recent survey found that snoring has a negative effect on one in five relationships. That is terrible. It's every night. No. Same. It doesn't believe me, this is why I have to tape it. I'm on my way to meet two couples whose sleep is disrupted by the most unearthly noises to see if we can help. This is Alec from Peterborough, whose frankly outrageous snoring has been keeping his wife, Sarah, awake for years. Hello. Alec? Hello. Yes, hello. yes. Hello. How this do you do, okay. Hello. Nice Likewise. to meet you. Do Likewise. come in. Thank you. So, Alec, I hate to say it, but it's pretty loud, your snoring. It's horrible. It's horrible. But unfortunately, it's Sarah who hears it, not me. Yeah, and, and it is having an impact, I should imagine, Sarah. Yes, it does, because I don't sleep properly and, you know, it just invades your brain and you can't switch off from it. It does make me feel guilty. And, uh, but, it's, you know, up to now, there's been very little I can do about it. Sally and Dave live in Norfolk, and Dave's snoring keeps the whole family awake. Sally, just describe it for us. It's pretty horrendous. It's all night long snoring. I feel really groggy in the mornings because of being constantly woken up, usually with an elbow or something in my ribs. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh about it and we kind of treat it as a joke, but there are times when it gets beyond a joke because you can't sleep and you're very tired. Which can obviously then impact on your relationship. Yeah, very much so. It's, it's worrying. Um, that would suggest... Snoring is a serious matter for David and Alec. Not only can snoring disrupt your partner's sleep, at its worst, snoring can be linked to serious health conditions such as high blood pressure, strokes and heart attack. So what exactly is happening when we snore? Well, when we sleep, the muscles that control our airways relax, causing the air passage to narrow. As a result, when we breathe, the soft tissues in the throat, mouth and nose vibrate. The result is snoring. We've asked our snorers to try out two over-the-counter remedies. Alec is trying out moistening strips designed to reduce the vibrations of the soft tissues in the mouth that cause snoring. Mm. Oh, well, we'll see if it works. I hope so. 
Dave is going to try a special mouth guard designed to keep his tongue from falling to the back of his mouth. Hello, darling. Mm. Fingers crossed, both couples will get a good night's sleep. Hello, hello. I asked Dave hello. and Sally how they've got on. Hello. Hello. Don't ask. <laughs> how did you go? Not very well. Oh, this sounds such a shame. So what went wrong? The uh, mouth guard, it made me gag, unfortunately. It's not very nice at all, um, but it's going to take a bit of practice. I'm going to practice using it during the day. They recommend trying it a couple of minutes during the day until you actually get used to it to stop the gagging. And then gradually I'll hopefully better wear it at night. Are you going to persevere with oh, it? Oh, yeah. Then? You will? Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah, I've got to. Yeah, otherwise I'll be in trouble. <laughs> 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 OK, hopefully better news with Alec and Sara. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> how are we? Fine, great. Good news. I think it's made a big difference. Fabulous. Yeah. So how many hours sleep did you get? Um, well, nearly a full night, so it was great. It hasn't eradicated it completely but it's cut down the volume. Yeah, which made a lot of difference. Which has made a big difference in you. Yeah. And we both feel as if we had a good night's sleep. Fantastic. So thank you very much. I'm thrilled. Absolutely yeah. delighted well, so for you we. both. Thank you. you're both getting yeah. a good night's sleep <laughs> yes. now. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So snoring can sometimes be beaten. An over-the-counter remedy may do the trick for mild snorers, but heavy snorers who also fall asleep during the day should consult their GP, as it may be a sign of a more serious condition. We all know how we feel when we've had a good night's sleep, but what exactly is going on? Well, we've set up a little experiment to demonstrate the various cycles of sleep we go through, just how important they are, and how easily they can be disrupted. To do so, we're going to use two of the world's most popular legal mood-altering substances, coffee and alcohol. James Hoffman knows everything there's to know about coffee. He's a world champion barista. A barista is someone who's skilled in the art of preparing coffee, which is what I've been doing for about five years now. So I can make the perfect cup. Holly Sharp is a qualified wine taster and has spent her life studying the tipple of her choice. My mum and dad used to feed me grape juice on the dining room table and it just went on from there. I love it. It's, it's my life. It's my passion. Holly and James are heading off to spend the night together, not in a romantic hotel, but in one of Britain's leading sleep laboratories at the University of Surrey. You might already think coffee keeps us awake at night and a late night tipple can help ease us to sleep. But is it as simple as that? Holly and James have agreed to be scientifically tested to find out how what we drink before we go to bed can affect the duration and, most importantly, quality of our sleep. To ensure the tests are credible, Holly and James will swap drinks as they may know their effects too well. Holly's selecting one of her favourite full-bodied reds for James to test. And James wants Holly to try his special high-roasted Kenyan coffee. All right. So... Enjoy. Over the next few hours, just before they go to bed, Holly will drink three cups of coffee and James three glasses of wine. Our sleep experts will monitor Holly and James's sleep to see how it's disrupted by what they drink. And we've got ECG electrodes on you to record the brain waves that we see during sleep. Do you feel caffeinated? Yeah, I feel awake. Really awake? Yeah. I feel quite sleepy. Right, there you go, you're all wired up. OK. Good night. Locked in their individual cells, both are under constant surveillance. Throughout the night, their brain waves will be monitored, revealing when they go to sleep and what type of sleep they're getting. So what normally happens when we, we, we turn off the lights, 
it, it will probably take 10 to 15 minutes before we see the first um, stage of sleep. There are five stages of sleep. Those five stages form a cycle. In stage one, we feel drowsy. In stage two, we fall into a light sleep. In stage three and four, we're in deep sleep. Stage five is when we dream and is revealed by rapid eye movements. A healthy night's sleep would see us going through four to six cycles. Disrupting our sleep cycle can affect our ability to concentrate, cause mood swings and damage our long-term health. So how did coffee affect Holly's sleep cycle? <laughs> it took me a while to go to sleep. Normally I hit the pillow and I'm out for the count. According to her readings, coffee did make it harder for Holly to fall asleep. But when she did sleep, she spent more time in light sleep and experienced less deep sleep. The result? A restless sleep cycle. I don't know how many times I woke up in the night, but it was a fair few. So after caffeine intake, it takes us longer to fall asleep. Deep sleep stages may be suppressed in, in the beginning and there may be more awakenings. Good morning. It's time to get up. I was conscious of being awake quite a lot during the night. It didn't, didn't feel very complete or refreshing. I'm quite tired this morning. In James's case, the alcohol made him fall asleep very quickly. No surprise, perhaps. But he took much longer than average to reach REM sleep. And crucially, James woke up many times during the second half of the night. When we drink uh, alcohol, uh, we will fall asleep quickly. We will have quite a bit of deep sleep. But then in the second half of the sleep episode, uh, we will have more wakefulness. So despite the fact that the alcohol helped us to fall asleep, it doesn't help us to maintain sleep. Both Holly and James had a disturbed night's sleep because of the coffee and alcohol they drank just before bed. I drink wine on a regular basis and I drink coffee. I had absolutely no idea that caffeine or alcohol could affect your sleep so, so seriously. Going into this, you know, I was aware alcohol affected my sleep, but I didn't think it was quite this sensitive. So, yeah, I think I'd be much more aware now of every drink before bed. Ensuring your body properly goes through all five stages of sleep is essential for your general well-being. The best way to keep to your full sleep cycle is have, on average, eight hours sleep a day. And, of course, avoiding alcohol and coffee before bedtime will help. As an early riser, I'm always on the lookout for ways to feel more awake in the morning. Next up, we're going to look at a clever idea that could help. It's four o'clock in the morning and I'm on my way to work for BBC breakfast. As you can see, it's still very dark outside. It's quite busy because obviously in today's 24-hour society, so many of us need to be up uh, working around the clock when really our bodies would rather be asleep. In the newsroom, the early start affects us all. It's like super jet lag plus mega PMT. <laughs> Bill tells me off because he says that I just don't get the get it right. You have to get used to it, really, and, and work with it. If you fight it, you've lost. Coffee really helps, but the occasional sneaky afternoon nap and then treat myself to a lovely lie-in Saturday or Sunday. Seven o'clock or something like yeah. that. <laughs> Most of us are normally alert during the day and sleepy at night. So we might expect that light triggers wakefulness. But it was only in 2002 that scientists found the specific cells that do indeed wake us up. And what's exciting is that by using this discovery, we can now trick the body into feeling more alert. Professor Bird? Hello. Hello. Kate. To find out more, I've come to Moorfields Eye Hospital to meet Professor Alan Bird. OK, we're going to put the drop eye drops in now. They may sting a little bit. He's one of a team of scientists behind a remarkable discovery into how the eye affects our body clock. Close gently as if you're asleep. No. 
And the professor is going to scan my retina to show me how. I'm ready for my close-up, am I? Yes. Yep. OK. Just stare straight ahead. That's very good. Historically, scientists thought simply seeing light wakes us up. But in 2002, they identified a whole new group of receptor cells at the back of the eye which help control our sleep patterns. When our eyes are open, light passes through the eye to the retina at the back of the eyeball. These tiny cells in the retina contain a pigment that reacts to daylight. These cells send signals to the brain that then regulates melatonin production. And it's melatonin levels in blood that determine whether you're sleepy or whether you're wide awake. At night, the body increases the supply of the hormone melatonin to help us sleep. As daylight peeks through the curtains, a relay race begins around the brain. Even though the eyelids are closed, the cells in the retina react to blue light. They send a signal to the brain's biological clock that alerts the pineal gland to reduce the production of the sleep hormone melatonin. As a result, the body becomes more alert and wakes up. We can use this knowledge to make sure we sleep through the night by keeping our curtains tightly shut to block out any daylight. We can also use light to trick the brain and wake up the body in the middle of the night. Using the blue light research, I'm going to see if I can make getting up in the morning a slightly less painful experience. Hello, good morning. When I'm working on BBC Breakfast, I have to get up at 3 a.m. Feels like hell, if I'm honest. This morning, to make it even worse, I have to chew a saliva swab to measure my melatonin levels. <laughs> really disgusting. <laughs> now for the experimental bit. I'm going to have my breakfast sitting in front of this special blue light lamp. As I'm eating my breakfast and making my notes for the morning, I now have the benefit of this light. It's a special light. It mimics the quality of, of daylight, which obviously my normal bulbs can't do. And I'm hoping it will trick my body into thinking it is a more normal time to get up. After just over half an hour in front of the light, it's time for another <laughs> mouth swab. Uh, this should be able to tell me if there's a difference in my melatonin level after exposure to the special daylight lamp. My melatonin should have gone down, causing increased alertness. OK, that wasn't the most pleasant thing to do or probably to watch, but um, the samples now go off to the lab and, uh, and get tested. It's only the first time I've tried it, but I definitely feel slightly more alert. Hello, good morning. You're watching Breakfast with Bill Turnbull and Kate Silverton. One's gone, the other's suspended. The BBC so did my early morning wake-up session in front of the lamp really help reduce my melatonin levels? What will those swabs reveal? You've got the results of your melatonin levels. And when we compare 3 a.m. when you woke up, to 3.40, there's a 60% reduction in melatonin in the saliva. That's an incredible result, a 60% drop in my melatonin levels, and that's after just half an hour in front of the blue lamp. So it's not just subjective that I felt more perky then, it was uh, actually down here in black and white. We would expect this drop to be associated with a much greater wakefulness, much greater alertness, probably more effective at work. So that, that's really very impressive. Yeah, I was going to get one. Yes. My bosses will be happy. I see. Blue light can be useful for early risers like me, but if you want to sleep through the night, keep those curtains tightly shut or use blackout blinds to block out the daylight. We've already seen how what we drink can affect our sleep. Well, what we eat can make a big difference too. Some foods will make us feel more perky, others can help us to drop off. To find out more about how what we eat affects how we sleep, we enrolled the help of one of Britain's top chefs. All right, boys, are we ready? Yeah, good, that's what I like to do. Aldo Zilli works long hours in a hot kitchen and getting enough sleep for him is essential. 
you know, my sleeping is not as great as I could be. If I don't have my sleep, these poor guys here get get the other side of me. Via la ragosta qua, go with the lobster. Aldo's going to help us find out the best thing to eat to keep you awake during the day or to help send you to sleep at night. How are you, man? We've set him the challenge of making two very different types of meal. Red onion, very nice. One rich in carbohydrates, the other rich in protein. And we're going to measure the effects the two meals have on our alertness. I'm hoping today I'm going to learn a lot more about it. Brown pasta, that was on the list. For the carbohydrate-based meal, Aldo's preparing potato dumplings with a pesto sauce. And for the protein meal, a nice fillet of cod with vegetables and mixed beans. Via. We've asked Aldo to prepare meals for identical twins, Duncan and Sandy. They share many identical genes, have the same sort of metabolism, and both haven't eaten for four hours. Scientists have devised an ingenious way of measuring alertness. Anya kushitska Knox from Westminster University is overseeing the Flicker Fusion Threshold Frequency Test. Each twin is shown a fast flashing light, which gradually speeds up until it appears to be continuous. The twin who first sees the light as continuous is the most tired. The twins had already done the same test before the meal, so now an accurate measurement of the effect of food can be made. The results are in, and Aldo's keen to see the effect his food has had on the twins. Sandy, you had the gnocchi. We can tell that um, you feel more sleepy and you're less alert. A little bit, yeah. Meals rich in carbohydrates set off a chain reaction which makes us sleepy. When carbohydrates are digested in the stomach, they release insulin, which in turn helps the chemical tryptophan enter the brain. There, it's turned into serotonin, and serotonin makes us sleepy. So the immediate effect is yes. tiring, siesta. Siesta time. And Duncan, you had the fish, so high protein meal, and we can tell that you feel now more alert. Yep. Eating proteins has the opposite effect to carbs. Proteins change into amino acids, which reduce the amount of tryptophan entering the brain. So less of the sleep-inducing serotonin is produced. As a result, we tend to feel more alert. I'm well impressed, as you two are with my food. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> what you eat can help you control how tired you feel. A protein meal at lunch might well help stop you dropping off in the afternoon, and a carb-heavy meal in the evening should help you get to sleep if eaten around four hours before bedtime. Jet lag can be hugely disruptive to our sleep patterns. I've tried the usual tips, change your watch to local time, don't drink alcohol on the flight. None of them seem to work, so I was very intrigued by the latest scientific research that could provide a solution. International racing drivers Oliver Gavin and David Brabham live in Britain but race in America. Their life is a succession of departure desks and in-flight movies as each year they jet backwards and forwards across the Atlantic dozens of times. You can end up by the end of the year getting this great big ball of jet lag. Your head feels like concrete and you're sort of like, oh. God. Motor racing is all about split-second decisions and jet lag can mean the difference between winning and losing. It's a very serious, very competitive environment. I'm looking for anything that's going to give me an edge. Well, one man thinks he may have found the answer to jet lag. Bring on Dr. Patrick Fuller from Harvard University. He believes he's found a way to reset the body clock and beat jet lag. And he's going to try his theory out on our drivers. What they don't know is, this is just a theory. It hasn't been tested in humans and it's actually only been tested in mice. 
All animals have an internal food clock which helps regulate sleep. In humans, it's largely dormant, but it's still there in the hypothalamus. In Dr. Fuller's tests, when the body was starved for 16 hours, the food clock activated and took over the sleep pattern. We hypothesized that maybe we could resynchronize the organism very rapidly and very quickly by putting, in this case, the human being on a restricted feeding paradigm. Mm. Put simply, we're going to starve one of our drivers to see if we can reset his body clock. To decide who starves, a coin toss. Gonna go for heads. It's tails. Yes. So David, on the left, will go without food on the way home, while Oliver, on the right, can eat as much airline food as he likes. I won't taunt you with it at all. Did you get that? Before leaving the States, Dr. Fuller carries out a series of response tests on David and Oliver to measure their levels of concentration and alertness. These tests will be repeated when they're back in the UK to then detect any change in performance resulting from jet lag. On the freeway to the airport, the experiment is underway. David can't eat anything until he gets to London. I'm hungry. I'm not going to enjoy sitting watching you stuff your face anyway. <laughs> so our guinea pig, David, can only drink water until he lands in the UK. Cheers. While Oliver's allowed to indulge in anything he likes. Yeah, and I think I'm going to get um, a chicken burrito. Extra cheese, please. David's going to love this. I'm peckish. I, I, I'm not starving. I'm peckish. I'm... Look at that lovely cheese. On the flight home, David can sleep as much as he likes. The important thing is that he doesn't eat anything until he arrives back in the UK. On arrival in London, David's body clock is telling him it's 2.30 a.m., the time back in Atlanta. What we want to do is reset his body clock to UK time. Hello, good morning, gentlemen. Morning, of the classic, thanks. The first meal in the new time zone is critical. According to Dr. Fuller's theory, because David has gone without food for 16 hours, his food clock will have activated and will then override his natural desire to sleep. So eating breakfast in London on UK time, his body clock should be reset to local time. It's uh, just what I needed. <laughs> David has just crossed five time zones in eight hours. It will normally take his body several days to catch up with the new time zone. As night falls in the UK, it's only early evening back in Atlanta. The real test of whether David has beaten jet lag will be how quickly he can readjust to his normal sleep pattern. It's uh, quarter past 10. I've had a couple of moments through the day where I felt a little bit tired. I'm gonna go to bed now and see if I can get some sleep. Uh, I'll see you in the morning. Well, it's 6.36 in the morning. A cup of tea's going, and I feel pretty good. So maybe it's working. So after using the pioneering new technique, David has had a good night's sleep on his return from America. It's an amazing result for him. But will Oliver, who didn't go without food on his journey, be suffering from jet lag? I was asleep by about 11, and then uh, woke up again at 3, then again at 5. So. Um, Still feel very sort of disorientated and not really that with it. Rabs, how are you, mate? Oliver is clearly suffering from the classic symptoms of jet lag. But David appears much perkier and certainly seems to think he's benefited from our no-food travel plan. But has he? To check the hard data, Dr Dirk Jan Dyke from Surrey University has come along to repeat the response tests that David and Oliver took in America. He's going to assess whether David, by starving himself for 16 hours and only eating again when he landed back in the UK, really has beaten jet lag. OK, the moment of truth. Who will be more alert? Oliver's reaction times have made a slight improvement. But how did David do? And now, David, after flying through five time zones, 
you are faster. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this looks uh, interesting and, and, and promising. The results show that over the range of tests, David performed better than Ollie. And crucially, it was David who got a full night's sleep back in Britain. So the data seems to support David's own feeling that he's not suffering from jet lag. The fasting and Dr. Fuller's theory seem to have worked. So a question, are you going to do it again next time you fly to the US? Yeah, definitely, because um, my, my own experience tells me that, you know, I actually feel pretty good. Um, it's something I'll definitely use for next year. So a fabulous result then for David and the most amazing thing about his experience is that not only was he more alert uh, after the long fast but he was also able to sleep through the entire night on his return. So he's really happy, I'm really happy, I've just tried it on a long haul flight myself. I only fasted for nine hours but it worked. So if you can forego your airline food, I'm not sure if you'll think that's a huge sacrifice or not, I definitely suggest giving it a go. So if you want to avoid jet lag next time you fly long haul, try avoiding food on the flight and only eat again at the first regular meal time when you arrive. Stress is the enemy of sleep. You know, where you're tossing and turning and mulling over the events of the day and you just can't get to sleep. Well, now there's a proven technique that just might help you. To road test this stress-busting technique, we enlisted the help of Russell Kane, one of the country's brightest young comics. Smallest unit of American communication. How was your day? Great, my day was great. Let's go to the bar after I've had a workout. <laughs> when he's not performing stand-up, Russell's got a radio show to present too. This is Russell Kane on Q Radio with you till 3 p.m. Russell says with his hectic schedule, he gets too little sleep, which leaves him more anxious than he should be. I feel guilty if I feel stressed, because I'm like, oh, you don't deserve to feel stressed. You're so lucky to be doing the job you do. But of course, your body doesn't know that I'm lucky. So my brain's saying, you're so lucky, and my body's going, ah. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Tonight, Russell's performing two shows to full houses at London's Soho Theatre. One, two, one, two. I'm on stage in an hour. My head's spinning from all the different things I've done. Ooh. What I'll be doing is pacing, doing everyone's head, in, heart rate increased, sweating, having doubts and insecurities. Oh God, they didn't laugh. That gets the adrenaline going as well as reaching for the emodium. Please welcome to the stage the fantastic Russell Kane. <laughs> With his odd hours, Russell often struggles to get a good night's rest. So we're going to see if we can help him improve his sleep using a simple relaxation therapy. I've tried not to learn too much about it because my weakness is when I hear about a therapy, I want it to work too much and then I get anxious and then it doesn't work. To find out what the therapy is and see if it can help him, Russell's come to meet physiotherapist Sammy Margot. My problem is because my schedule changes, I sometimes have deadlines where I have to get to sleep. I panic straight away. I'm like, oh, I have to get to sleep now or I'm not going to get to sleep. Okay. Added to that is the fact I have no regular sleep pattern. Yeah. Some nights I'm going to bed at 5 a.m. Yeah. The next night I've got to be asleep at 11 p.m. to be up for 7. So I've always got that feeling of my body clock's never regulated. It's really not unusual for people like yourself who are quite hyper and quite high energy mm. to respond really well to taking literally just a little bit of time out, doing some breathing exercises mm. and this technique that we're going to do it will help you in terms of your performance and it will also help you with the quality of your sleep as well. Mm. That would be nice. To scientifically test whether the relaxation therapy does work, Russell takes a swab to test his cortisol levels. Cortisol is a hormone produced when we're stressed. If the therapy works, Russell's cortisol levels should go down. Okay. I feel like I'm being tucked in. Can I have a story? <laughs> when we're stressed, our muscles are tense. Progressive muscle relaxation works by undoing that tension in the muscles. So scrunch your foot as hard as you can. Hold it there, hold it there, hold it there. And then let go. You might feel a bit... Starting with his toes, Sammy gets Russell to tense, then release each part of the body in turn. Keep it 
there and let it go nice and relaxed. Let the tension... By tensing and then releasing the muscles one group at a time, it allows the whole body to relax. We're now going to move on to working the buttocks. Buttocks are an area where you carry a whole load of tension. Can you not say working the buttocks? It's just something about that phrase that's making me laugh. Squeeze your buttocks as hard as you can. Bend it up. If you try this at bedtime, it really can help you to sleep better. Open your mouth as wide as you can. Hold it there, hold it there and let it go. That's great. After 20 minutes of the muscle relaxation therapy, the normally hyperactive Russell has almost fallen asleep. How are you feeling, Russell? Incredibly um, physically relaxed, but mm -hmm. I also feel... Well, my mind feels clear. I can't see how that relates to the muscles, but it does. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually thinking about anything. It's bliss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're normally in a hyper-aroused state, and what we've done is we've taken you into a much more relaxed state than you ordinarily would be. Yeah, I reckon I could have a little kiff now, quite happily. Compared with normal levels at this time of day, Russell's cortisol has dropped dramatically, indicating a reduction in stress. Not bad for just 20 minutes of tensing and relaxing. You would think it would do nothing, and yet it did. Before you've even got halfway up the body, you're starting to get into that state just before you fall asleep, that, that really nice not awake, not asleep state. Next time I've got one of those sleep deadlines where I'm like, oh my God, I've only got six hours to sleep. How am I going to get to sleep? I'm panicking about how much sleep I'm going to, I'm going to stop and think, right, scrunch the toes straight in the feet, triceps, biceps, buttocks, of course, uh, face, and then, you know, see if it works. I'm going to test it in the field. And Russell's been doing just that. Using the therapy to help him sleep better during his current tour, he seems to have become something of a convert. It's actually revolutionised me getting my eight hours sleep. Instead of getting five or six hours, I think, right, I've got to get to sleep now. And I'll do this muscle relaxation exercise and I'm off. It's the one, the only, it's Russell Kane! I mean, I don't go to sleep, I don't rest, I'm like, hmm. and it's, it's been brilliant. So if you can't sleep and you want to help your body wind down before bed, tense and relax your muscles for about 15 minutes before bedtime. It's a simple and effective method to help you fall asleep faster. We've looked at plenty of scientific ways to help you sleep. But for many people, help could be at hand right at the bottom of the garden. So we thought we'd check out some of the most popular traditional natural sleep remedies. I'm normally quite sceptical about stuff like this, but at the same time, there's a lot of medicines that are, you know, herbal based. Yeah, and things like arnica and comfrey, I've used those on aches and sprains and they definitely work. A cup of coffee I have in the morning, it wakes me up. We took two gardeners, Joe Swift from Gardener's World and his friend from the allotment, Sabina Holkory. We set them the task of finding two plants associated with traditional sleep remedies. Joe's on the hunt for some lavender and Sabina's trying to find a less well-known plant called valerian. I haven't actually found anything yet. I think the problem is that valerian is something that would be considered a weed, I suppose. So you know, the plots are looked after quite well and people are just keeping down the weeds. Joe's having a bit more luck with his search. Lavender. Perfect. Yeah. It's just right as well. Look, the flowers have just gone over. Mm, it smells gorgeous. Lavender, you know, you smell lavender, and you go, ah, you know, and it, it does relax you, but whether it relaxes you enough to actually help you sleep, we'll find out. Sabina's hunt for valerian is a little harder. The flower used to be cultivated in gardens, but now is mostly found wild. So to make Sabina's task easier, we planted one earlier. <laughs> it's in the shape of a pot. Joe's returned to the shed to make a tea with his lavender. Here, to keep an eye on our budding homeopaths, is medical herbalist 
Christy Atkinson. Hi there, Sabina. Hi. How's it going? I found what I think we're looking for, uh, the valerian. I think it was a little bit mean sending you off to get valerian. Wrong time right. of year to harvest it. There's hardly any there. There's only a young plant. So what I've done is I've brought some really nice okay. valerian root. This is perfect for making into a tincture. Right. Ready to give it a go? Yes, I'm very excited. Well, I've got a recipe here. It's a very old recipe from a 1790 Marix herbal for a tincture of valerian. Okay? Great, yeah, I think it's... I can manage that. Right, I'll leave you to okay, it. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Plants and flowers have been used to aid sleep for centuries. Victorian doctors used to recommend opium to help you drop off. That's obviously no longer advised, but plant extracts such as valerian form part of many of today's herbal remedies. How are you getting on, Sabina? Well, it's all mixed in this jar and macerating. It's changing colour it looks very great. rapidly. You can see yeah. that everything's starting to be extruded and extracted, and it's, it's starting mm. to look like a tincture. It is, yes. There's only one problem. It's going to take about two weeks for that to turn into a medicine. Which means that I can't take it. No, you're not escaping that easily. <laughs> I have brought with me some valerian tincture for you to try tonight. All right, has to be done. Joe's not leaving anything to chance. He's not only prepared his lavender tea, he's also rustling up another soothing remedy. Oh, Joe, what are you doing here? Well, I'm making myself a lavender <sighs> foot bath, Sabina. It smells yeah. great. What are you doing? Um, I need from you some hot water ah. because I need to mix this tinc tincture up. OK, I can do that. I think that's about enough. Oh, is that enough? Oh, you enough. Ignore, enough. ignore the little bits of lavender in there. They're just, right. uh, just see them as an added bonus. Mm -hmm. And actually, if I pour myself a cup of tea, can you take them out and I'll bring my foot bath out? You, you're really making a foot bath? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm exactly. first let, in. Let, you're serious, oh. aren't you? My yeah. feet are going to smell beautiful by the end of this. <laughs> Oh, that is nice. Cheers. Cheers. And here's to a good night's sleep. Absolutely. Mm. That is very lavendery. Yes. Joe and Sabina will take another dose of their remedies before bedtime. And we've asked them to report back on whether the concoctions have worked. Good morning. <laughs> morning. Good morning. Did you have a good night's sleep? Um, yeah, I had a good night's sleep. Um, probably the longest sleep I've ever had, about 11 hours. Great. Yeah. I, I feel... Completely refreshed. It was a quality night's sleep. I think that's what it was. So a successful night's sleep for both Joe and Sabina, who really seem to feel the benefits of their herbal remedies. According to two recent small-scale scientific studies, it's the smell of lavender that helps induce sleep. Anecdotal evidence suggests it's worth giving both lavender and valerian a try. So, in this film, we've tried out a whole host of sleep experiments. We've shown why warm baths really do help you to drop off, discovered a new way to beat jet lag, <laughs> helped a hyperactive comedian sleep better, revealed the power of napping, and cured a man of insomnia. I slept all right last night. <laughs> All in all, I hope you've learned some new things about sleep and most importantly, some helpful hints as to how to get more of it.